our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this Sabbath day. And Lord, we thank you for your word, which you've promised to open to our hearts and minds if we seek you earnestly. Lord, this morning we ask that you shut us in with you. May you speak to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, this morning's message is entitled The Wicket Gate. And uh, I've been enjoying listening to an audio version lately of John Bunyan's famous work. And many of you will have heard his name. John Bunyan lived in the 1600s. And in the year 1661, he was thrown into prison for three months for preaching without a license. Now, you didn't know you needed one of those, did you? But John Bunyan preached without a license. And he was thrown into prison for it. He didn't even try to run away. They came and collected him from the church service. They put him in prison for three months. And it turned into 12 years. Why? Because he wouldn't promise not to do it again. You know, many people would be discouraged by a bit of persecution. John Bunyan was there for 12 years and still wouldn't promise not to do it again when he got out. I'm encouraged by that. 12 years rotting in a prison. And I can assure you that prisoners' rights were not then what they are now. But in the midst of his adversity, God blessed him enormously. I believe angels were by his side while he was in prison. Not to set him free physically, perhaps, but to set his mind free. Because it's while he was in prison there that he began to write that famous book, which you've all heard of, The Pilgrim's Progress. And for those of you that haven't, this book uses uh, the illustration of a journey. The journey of a young convert to illustrate the perils of the Christian life as we head towards heaven. It's a story of a young man by the name of Christian. And Christian lives in a city called Destruction. He gets a great burden on his back after reading a book, the Bible. And this burden grows and grows until it becomes unbearable. So much so that he's driven to despair. While he is in his state of despair in the city of destruction, a man comes to him by the name of Evangelist. An evangelist, unfortunately, tells him that he's not able to help him with his burden. He can't take it from his back. But he directs him to go immediately, with the heavy burden on his back, to the wicket gate. And there he's promised that he'll be told what to do. And so Christian sets off on his journey with his burden on his back to the wicket gate. After reaching the gate, he's taken to the cross. And at the cross, the burden rolls away from his back. He's given new clothes and a scroll to read from. And he is marked for heaven and sent on his way. The book then details his adventures on the way to the celestial city. Of course, as you've figured by now, Bunyan's book is an allegory. And the wicket gate is a symbol for Jesus Christ. Where did he get this idea? John records it well. John chapter 10 and verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Acts 4 verse 12 records, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And this young pilgrim, Christian, experienced what every Christian must experience if they are truly converted. Did you catch that? Christian's experience must be experienced by every person who claims that they are converted and going to heaven. 
In today's message, I'm going to outline a little more of what that means, of how that applies in our Christian life today. Ellen White makes an interesting statement in the book Great Controversy on page 461. She says this, Wherever the Word of God has been faithfully preached, results have followed that have attested its divine origin. The Spirit of God accompanied the message of His servants, and the Word was with power. Sinners felt their consciences quickened. The light which lighted every man that cometh into the world illumined the secret chambers of their souls, and the hidden things of darkness were made manifest. Does this sound like what happened to Christian? Deep conviction took hold upon their minds and their hearts. They were convinced of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. They had a sense of the righteousness of Jehovah and felt the terror of appearing in their guilt and uncleanness before the searcher of hearts. In anguish they cried out, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? As the cross of Calvary with its infinite sacrifice for the sins of men was revealed, they saw that nothing but the merits of Christ could suffice to atone for their transgressions. This alone could reconcile man to God. With faith and humility, they accepted the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Through the blood of Jesus, they had remission of sins that are past. Does that sound like Christian's experience? And does it sound like your experience? Like the old hymn says, At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Friends, does that sound like your experience? Do you remember the deep conviction that took a hold of your heart? When you heard the word of God preached to you and you thought to yourself, what am I going to do? Jesus is coming. I'm not ready to meet him. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then when Jesus was presented to you, the sinner's hope, you felt the burden roll away. A new life new hope into your heart. Friends, if that is not your experience, then we need to think very carefully. Because today, as in times past, many try to come into fellowship with God's people in some other way. Without having that experience, perhaps they don't feel the conviction of sin or maybe they have no desire to humble themselves before God and surrender their hearts to Christ. Perhaps they long to have spirituality in their life, but they're unwilling to let the sins of the world, the city of destruction, alone and flee to Jesus. Or perhaps they see the benefits of being a Christian and having a virtuous life but they shun the cross that they will invariably meet along the way. Or maybe they are socially acceptable churchgoers. You know, respectable people who have never seen themselves as vile and corrupt, having any special need of forgiveness. Sinners who are no more corrupt than the next person acceptable by society standards. They have never seen themselves as sinners who must have Jesus or die in their sins. Friends, while we may pass as Christians to our fellow church members, Jesus makes no secret of these ones who sneak into the church. John chapter 10 and verse 1, Jesus says very plainly, which is what these words mean, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, he that entereth not by the door, what's the door? Christ. 
He who entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, I don't know if you've ever been called a bad name. But I know that for many of us, it would hurt quite, uh, quite uh, acutely if we were called a thief or a robber. Why are they thieves or robbers? Because they've tried to join the church for all kinds of reasons that don't include a heart broken and surrendered to Christ. Why are they thieves and robbers? Because they want to claim the promises of God. They want to claim eternal life without meeting the conditions. They want to buy the pearl of great price without giving all that they have. You know, last week, my work colleague told me a story. She was very distressed when she came into work. You see, she had been on holiday for a few days. And when she came home, she came in through the front door, unlocked it, did a few jobs, sat down, and then noticed that something was amiss. There was a big gap where her TV used to be. Well, as I said, the front door was shut when she got home. But as she went around the house, she found that a side window was open. And two thieves, actually it was, one was a child, had uh, made their way in through the window. How do we know this? Because they left their sticky fingerprints all over it. And I'm pleased to say that the police have lifted good fingerprints and know who the people are. Friends, I believe today that the Christian church has been robbed blind by people who have climbed in the window. How do I know this? Because they have left their sticky fingerprints everywhere except on the door handle. They've insinuated themselves into every aspect of church life, but they have never come through the door. They may play music and sing. They may teach theology and preach sermons. They may even run institutions and draw a salary from the church. But they didn't come in through the door. How do I know this with such certainty? As I said, their fingerprints are all over the windows. Listen to what Alan White writes in the book Great Controversy, page 463 and 464. She says, with every truly converted soul, the relation to God and eternal things will be the great topic of life. But where in the popular churches of today is the spirit of consecration to God? The converts do not renounce their pride and love of the world. They are no more willing to deny self, to take up the cross and follow the meek and lowly Jesus than before their conversion. Religion has become the sport of infidels and skeptics because so many who bear its name are ignorant of its principles. The power of godliness has well nigh departed from many of the churches. How does she know this? Listen to what she mentions. Picnics. Church theatricals. What does she mean by that? Dramas instead of sermons. Church fairs. Fine houses, personal display. Have you noticed a proliferation of jewelry and adornment in the churches? These things have banished thoughts of God. Lands and goods and worldly occupations engross the mind, and things of eternal interest receive hardly a passing notice. We see worldliness increasing, not just in the world, but also in the church. We see church members engrossed in entertaining themselves at church. Personal battles and power struggles. Getting assets. Advancing careers. Friends, when we see those in the church eating, drinking, dressing, talking, 
buying just like the world, we may know that they have climbed in the window and not come in the door. You know, Jesus said something very telling. He said, it is not by someone's words or profession that we are to weigh their character. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20 says, Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. By their fruits, by their fingerprints on the windows, you shall know them. Friends, perhaps it's a good time to do some self-reflection and ask ourselves what brought us into fellowship with God's church. Maybe my parents were Christians. And I've climbed in the window instead of coming in the door because I felt like the house belonged to me anyway. Maybe I came for the entertainment or because I had a good relationship with the pastor. Our church manual says something very important about church membership. It's right at the beginning almost. Listen to this. Page 43. The solemn obligations of membership in the body of Christ should be impressed on everyone desiring church membership. Only those giving evidence of having experienced the new birth and enjoying a spiritual experience in the Lord Jesus are prepared for acceptance into membership. Pastors must instruct candidates in the fundamental teachings and related practices of the church so that they will enter the church on a sound, catch this, spiritual basis. I'm not saying that nothing else is important. But your basis of belonging to God's church is spiritual, not social. Friends, what has gone wrong? Why is there such hard-heartedness? Not in the world, but in the church. Why do we see sinners coming into the church with all their sins? Is it that the preachers are too kind? Have we not got Bibles to determine what's right and wrong? Or maybe God's power to convert sinners has waned over the years. He spent it all at Pentecost. He used the rest up during the Reformation. I believe in our church we have talked much about coming to Christ. In fact, it has almost become a cliché. Today we have entire church programs that aim to be Christ-centered and Jesus-focused. There are some movements within the church, or maybe attached to the church, that loudly profess to make Jesus all. Maybe you know of some of them. But while we talk about Jesus a great deal, I believe that we have come to understand it incorrectly. You see, for many, the idea of coming to Jesus simply means feeling emotional when a preacher gets worked up. They think that is coming to Jesus. Or perhaps it means feeling tearful when some sentimental religious pop song is played in church with all the accompaniments. And they mistake that for the voice of Jesus. For others, coming to Jesus means getting into the church social scene, having a good relationship with a pastor or a church administrator, and just so I don't leave your sins alone. For more conservative members, coming to Jesus can mean little more than accepting the intellectual doctrines of the church, knowing about the mark of the beast. As long as you know who the Antichrist is, you're an Adventist. Wrong. Great controversy again, page 463. She writes... Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination, by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling. Converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth, little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, it has no attractions for them. 
a message which appeals to unimpassioned reason awakens no response. The plain warnings of God's word relating directly to their eternal interests are unheeded. Friends, does that describe the churches of today? Everything is a get-up. Everything is entertainment. Everything is sociability and respectability, civility. How does the Bible teach? What does the Bible say about coming to Jesus? How does the Spirit of God draw a person into a saving relationship with Him? Why does the Bible say that it is necessary to bring every person through Bunyan's wicket gate? I believe the Spirit's first work in drawing a person to God is found in the book of Romans, chapter 3, and verses 19 and 20. This is what it says. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. Is this talking about worldly people? Are they under judgment? Are they under the law? Are they going to suffer the punishment in the city of destruction? They are. And the law speaks to them. That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. It goes on in verse 23 to say, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, to be converted, the first thing we must know, the first thing we must have is a knowledge of our condition. A knowledge of our sins. And how do we know what sin is? Sin is the transgression of the law. Unless we know what the law says, we don't know what our sins are. We need to know that we stand as guilty sinners before God. Sinners in fear of judgment and in desperate great need of God. Jesus said it plainly in Mark 2 verse 17. It says there, when Jesus heard it, he saith to them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, sometimes people can go on for years with an illness that they don't know they've got. Or maybe some condition that they have no idea is affecting their life. You know, and earlier this year, in fact, it was uh, 17th of February, 2016, a United Kingdom newspaper called The Mirror reported that Charlotte Bryant felt a little odd. She felt odd for about nine months before she gave birth to a baby boy in her toilet. You know, she should have had a doctor and a nurse with her, shouldn't she? Why didn't she? Because she didn't know that she was pregnant. She thought she had constipation. Friends, nobody will come to the doctor unless they think they're sick. And I can tell you, having a child is pretty stressful, especially when they're being born. You want to have a doctor or a nurse there, a midwife, but you wouldn't get one if you didn't think you were pregnant. we spend our time selling entertainment to worldly people, maybe flattering them into the church, they well may, well may like us, but they have no real need to join us. They'll take what we offer, they'll feel satisfied in their lost condition, thinking that they are okay. No, to be saved we need a knowledge of God's law. Preachers must preach righteousness. Righteousness is right doing. Listen to what Isaiah 58 verse 1 says. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. 
Friends, when we know the great standard, when we know the high calling that God has for us, and when we see our miserable failure at meeting it, we will, like young Christian in the city of destruction, feel a great burden on our back. We will feel crushed by our sins. We will feel hopeless. We will feel despair. We will feel guilt. All those things that the psychologists who have tried to insinuate themselves into our theology will tell you to avoid. But the Bible tells us it's necessary to receive our diagnosis. God has promised in Isaiah 55 verse 11 that his word will not return to him void. In other words, if we are faithful in holding up the standard, it will have an effect. God's promise in his word will be fulfilled. And the Spirit of God will cut. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 says. It says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you thought the sword of the Spirit was a drum kit and a bass guitar. Friends, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And when we preach the word of God, as it is written, God's spirit accompanies the message. We don't need to condemn people. We don't need to hurt them. We don't need to look down upon them because of their sins and their ignorance. On the contrary, we should be as courteous and kind as possible. Because when we preach the word of God, the spirit of God accompanies the message and cuts the heart. Listen to what John 16 verse 8 promises. Jesus says, And when he, the Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. How do you know the Spirit is in the church service? Because people are speaking in tongues? Gibberish rolling around on the floor? No. Because people are listening, they are silent. Because they are thinking. The Spirit is cutting their heart. And in their heart they are crying out, Lord, this is me. What must I do to be saved? That's how you know the Spirit is present. We should be careful not to get too scratchy at the preacher. It may be that our real tangle is with our own hearts and with the Word of God. Maybe our pride is getting in the way. But I can't stop there. Because conviction of our sins, of our lost condition, is not enough to save us. You know, I've met people who will willingly admit that they are sinners. I've tried to talk to them about God and about end time events and these sorts of things. And they say things like, oh yes, that's not for me. I know I'm a sinner. That's not for me though. Lost and they admit it. Conviction of our sin is not enough. All it gives me, like Pilgrim in the city of destruction, is a great burden on my back. And if we don't do something about that burden, it will drive us to such despair that we will give up hope. In fact, I know of people that have even taken their own lives because of the great burden on their back. When I look in the law, when I read God's word, I feel convicted, I feel condemned. I feel that I'm not good enough. And that's the way we should feel. But listen to Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Paul writes here, Do you despise the riches of, the goodness, of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. That King James English there. It says, do you count God's goodness as nothing? Don't you know that beholding God's goodness is what leads you to repentance? You see, many people know that they are sinners. They see the great gap 
between themselves and God. But we must also feel the saving touch of the love of Christ. That hand that has humbled us in the dust must then be outstretched to lift us up and heal us. When we see that it was out of God's great love for us, no, when you see that it was because of God's great love for you, when you say, Lord, now I see that you love me, and that is why you laid down your life, then we find healing. Listen to what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, for God so loved me, that he gave his only begotten son, that if I believe in him, I might not perish, but have everlasting life. It goes on. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn me, but so that I, through him, might be saved. Friends, this is a wonderful promise. If we believe that we are not good enough after we have looked in God's law, when we hear God's word preached, then we must also believe that God loves us enough to lift us up from nothingness and save us because of his love for us. Listen to what Romans chapter 5 verses 6 to 8 say. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. While I yet was opposed to Christ, he died for me. While I was still a worldly sinner, doing all the bad things that sinners do, that was when he died for me. Not when I came to church and put on a shirt and tie, but while I was still out there in my sins, that's when he died for me. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commends his love towards us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Does that humble you even more? To know that when we were doing the worst thing that we've ever done, Christ looked at us and said, I see promise there. That's my child. I'll give my life for him. I'll give my life for her. Yeah, I know she hates me at the moment. But there's a chance. There's a chance that one day they will come to appreciate that I love them. So I'll do all this on a chance. Is that love? Well, oh, friends, that should humble us. Friends, we spend too much time talking politics, talking church building plans, progress, statistics. Who has the chief seats at the feast? Not enough talk about what Christ has done for us and what he wants to do in our hearts. You know, we have many church documents that are prefaced by a very solemn statement of our mission. Our mission to preach the three angels' messages. You know what the three angels' message is about. We've heard it many times. We learn about the Sabbath. We learn about Babylon and its fallen condition. We learn about the mark of the beast. And don't get me wrong, these things are very important. In fact, they're imperative. Because it tells us something about where we stand today and the Jesus that we are accepting when we come to him. But we have to have it in a right context. And I think we have missed a very important part of the three angels' messages. It's right there at the beginning. Revelation 14, verse 6, John says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach that dwell on, to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Friends, the first angel, the first thing is the gospel. 
Listen to what Alan White says. Manuscript release number 1507. She says, hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. Hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. Now we have a message. What is that message? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Will not our church members keep their eyes fixed on a crucified and risen Savior, in whom their hopes of eternal life are centered? This is our message, our argument, our doctrine, our warning to the impenitent, our encouragement for the sorrowing, the hope of every believer. If we can awaken an interest in men's minds that will cause them to fix their eyes on Christ, we may step aside and ask them only to continue to fix their eyes upon the Lamb of God. Friends, Jesus on the cross shows us God's great standard of righteousness. It teaches me that God's law, the standard of character, requires my life if I break it. But it also shows me, when I see Jesus on the cross, the great love of God, who gave his only son to pay the penalty for my sins, and the great love of Christ, who willingly laid down his life for me. Friends, why are we so hard-hearted? Why have the churches not made a great work in the world? I believe it's because it spends too much time presenting facts and handing out entertainment instead of presenting the gospel. At the center of all we do as individuals and as a church, we must have a heart that is softened by love. Love because, what, because of what Christ has done for us. If we come into the church with that humble attitude that says, I'm a sinner, Christ died for my sins, I think that would change an awful lot. Ellen White writes again in Desire of Ages, page 83. She says, It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Oh friends, when was the last time you heard people talking about what Christ had done for them? When was the last time you shared with a brother or a sister what Jesus has done in your heart? When was the last time you heard church leaders Talk about how God has given them the victory and how God has saved them from their sins. Friends, we need more of Christ and less of us. You know, this problem has plagued the church from the beginning. I don't mean the Seventh-day Adventist church alone. I mean from the beginning of the world. You remember Cain? What did Cain want to do? He wanted to bring a thank offering to God. An offering that indicated that he had worked hard. That he had grown these things in the ground. And he wanted to praise and worship God. Well, praise and worship is one thing. But the first thing is an offering of sacrifice. We would do well to remember that in our praise and worship services, would we not? Before we stand up and shout and sing for God, we must know what it means to offer a sacrifice, to look at Christ as our salvation. Just imagine how things might have been different if Cain had humbled himself before he brought his thank offering. Could a humble sinner have gotten angry at his brother and killed him? Absolutely not. You know, Jesus had to humble himself, didn't he? Philippians 2 tells us, verse 5 to 8, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ also, 
who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was God. But he made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself even further. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He went from being God to dying the worst death a sinner could die. He humbled himself. And this is what we must do when we come into Christ's church. You remember Nicodemus. You know, the Jewish leaders in Christ's day refused to humble themselves. They ended up doing what Cain did to Abel. Nicodemus, that proud Pharisee, so proud he didn't want to be seen with Jesus. Only willing to visit him at night. You ought to be a bit suspicious if you have friends like that. They'll talk to you in private, but not in public. Nicodemus was so proud, he didn't want people to think ill of him. So he went to see Jesus at night. But look at what a change came over him in light of the cross. When he saw himself as a sinner in need of a saviour, when he saw Jesus hanging on a cross to save him from his sins, now he counted himself unworthy to receive the grace of God. Now his pride was gone. He wasn't afraid to stand up. He went boldly in broad daylight in the middle of a religious festival in front of all the other Jews. Joseph of Arimathea, he claimed the body of Christ. He touched that, that bruised and broken, bloodied body which would contaminate every Jew, least, least, no, no less a Pharisee. He was willing to be contaminated. He was willing to do anything for the Christ who had paid for his sins. His pride was gone. Like Paul, he could say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is what coming to Jesus does for a proud and hard heart. Friends, do you understand we all need to come to Jesus? All of us. Not just the people in the pews, the preachers, the pastors, the administrators. We all need to come to Jesus. We all need softened hearts that are willing to listen to God and be humble before each other. I speak of myself, but we cannot receive the power of Christ in this life, nor can we enter heaven unless we do. Jesus will count us as thieves and robbers. You know, in Bunyan's book, the pilgrim Christian continued on his journey. Went through the wicket gate, came to the cross, received his robe, received his parchment, received the mark that he belonged to Christ. And as he continued on this narrow path, the straight and narrow path to the celestial kingdom, he noticed that it would, was walled on either side. The walls were the walls of salvation. But as he looked, he saw two men Two men come tumbling over the wall. The name of one was called formalist. The name of the other, hypocrisy. He noticed that they had no burden on their back. Probably that made it easier to climb over the wall. They had no new set of clothes. They were in traveling clothes. And they had no parchment roll to read. But they wanted to be on the path. I'm going to read to you a little from Bunyan's book. Christian approaches them. He says, where did you come from? And where are you going? They replied, we were born in the land of vain glory. 
and we are going for praise on Mount Zion. Christian replied, Why came you not in at the gate, which standeth at the beginning of the way? Know you not that it is written, that he that cometh not in by the door, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber? They talked for a while, back and forth, but eventually hypocrisy and formalist grew weary of Christian simple faith. They grow, grew uneasy at his pertinent questions that revealed where they had come from and their true condition. Notice what they say to him here. This was their argument. They said to Christian, if we get into the way, what does it matter which way we get in? If we are in, we are in. Thou art but in the way, who as we perceive came in at the gate, and we are also in the way that came tumbling over the wall. In what way is your condition better than ours? Do you hear that argument today? As long as they come into the church, what does it matter which way they come in? Some come in through the rock music. Some come in through being sociable. And some come in through reading the great controversy. What does it matter which way they come in? This was their argument. We are in the way. We are heading to, to heaven. And you are heading to heaven. What does it matter which way we come in? So they walked with Christian for a while. But they ceased their conversation with him. And all seems to go well for a time with formalist and hypocrisy until they reached a hill, a hill called difficulty. You see, the narrow and straight path went straight up. But to the left and to the right were two easier paths. Christian, seeing that the narrow path to life led straight up the hill, drew water from a nearby spring with his hand and brought it to his mouth quickly, and having refreshed himself, courageously went forward in the straight and narrow path. The other two, formalist and hypocrisy, also came to the foot of the hill. But when they saw that the hill was steep and high, and that there were two other ways to go, and supposing also, that these two ways might meet again with that up which Christian went on the other side of the hill. Therefore, they were resolved to go in those ways. Now, the name of one of those ways was danger, and the name of the other, destruction. So the one took the way which is called danger, which led him into a great wood, and the other took directly up the way to destruction which led him into a wide field full of dark mountains where he stumbled and fell and rose no more. What does it matter which way we come in? Have we come in like formalist and hypocrisy over the wall? Contrary to God's instructions, only to go out without God's mercy when we reach the hill of difficulty? Or will we be like Christian, who fleeing the wrath to come, feeling our need, feeling our desperate need, come to the wicket gate and say, Lord Jesus, save me. I'm a sinner. Friends, nobody will walk the path to heaven all the way to heaven for a theory of the truth for church social life church office sooner or later we will be tested by difficulty a sabbath question a relationship question some other difficulty that we will face and unless the heart is yielded to christ we will surely take the easy way. 
only to meet destruction. Friends, is there a heart here this morning that needs to come to the wicket gate? Perhaps a heart that has climbed over the wall and found it difficult. Friends, Jesus wants us to come to him before we do anything else in the Christian life. Not just this morning, but every day until he comes again. Until we reach the kingdom that he has promised us. I know that today the Spirit has promised to be with the reading of his word. And I know that my heart has been touched as I have studied this out and as I have spoken of it this morning. And I know that some of you have had your hearts touched as well. Not by me, but by the Spirit of God. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and I want to pray for you that whatever difficulty you face, that you will come to Christ and surrender your life to him this morning. Will you bow your heads with me as I pray? Our Father in heaven, Lord, today you've shown us from your word that we need to come to you. Perhaps there are hearts here today, Lord, that are finding the way of Christianity difficult. Perhaps there are some of us who have never really surrendered ourselves to you. We are finding the choices that we're facing are taking us out of the way, that we are choosing the easy path because we have climbed in the window, we have come over the wall and our hearts are not really with you yet. Lord, we know that there is no hope for us. We are condemned sinners except you give your life for us. And so this morning, Lord, there are hearts that want to surrender to you. Lord Jesus, take our hearts. Take my heart. And Lord, may you save each one of us by your grace. May you help us to walk in the way. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.